So we see in the scriptures in Acts chapter four. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart, one soul. No one claimed private ownership of any possession, but everything they owned was held in common. In the last year, we've seen quite a lot of interesting things as a church. And some of you may think that I picked these scriptures out because of certain issues we've dealt with in the church. These scriptures, if you want to Google it on your phone or your computer, came out of the lectionary. The Ecumenical Council of Churches picks these scriptures out for a year A, year B, and a year C. What year are we in? I can't tell you. We're in C, I think, also. Either way, it's the right date with what I'm picking. But I don't have to use these. I was asked over at Kimballsville, do you have to use these? No. Do I use these scriptures sometimes? Yes, because it keeps me from going to where I want to go every week, and it allows you to read the scriptures, and we can see where God takes us through this. So I share this with you because the scriptures today speak of being of one heart, one soul, no one claiming possession of ownership of anything, but everyone shared what was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave our testimony of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was on them all. There was no needy people among them. As far as what they owned land, they sold it and brought the monies from what was sold. They didn't have to do fundraisers at the church. They sold the stuff on their own property and brought it to the church for use for God's kingdom. Hear what I'm saying. We don't have to have fundraisers through the church with a hundred meetings with a tough thing to make it work. Maybe just like how we started an Easter service, maybe I decide, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to sell a couple load of firewood this week. And I'm going to bring that money to the church because that's additional to my offering or my tithe. That's an offering. Tithing is 10% you give to God of what God's given you. An offering is over and above. We see the offering being right here over and above. Now, am I saying we shouldn't have fellowship? We shouldn't have opportunities as a church community to do things? No. But we shouldn't be so focused that we have to do these things in a fundraising aspect where the church won't make it. We become tied to that sort of thing. And we become lost in the mission of God. We become lost because... See, they brought the money to the apostles' feet, and nobody owned a thing. It was all God's for God's glory, for God's people. The psalmist declares many years before how good, very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. Did you Google it? Is a lectionary for real? Somebody Google something. I love, I love computer sounds. I wait for somebody to call during the sermon. I'm like, was that a call from God? No. Okay. Always waiting for God to call one of our cell phones. We see in the first chapter of John, we see in the first chapter of John where um, first John, first chapter, we declare to you what was in the beginning, what we heard, what we seen with our eyes, what we looked and touched with our hands concerning the word of life revealed to us we've seen it and testified to it and declared to you the eternal life that was with the father and was revealed to us now you're beginning to see a theme in these scriptures that unity and testify we use a word called witness and can i get a witness sometimes i'll hear people say amen uh, Jack and Nancy bought me a little thing that says, can I get an amen? It sits above my TV. It's awesome. I'll bring it sometime. But witness or testifying is uh, that we witness to the power of God, joys and concern. A little bit ago, you gave a testify, a witness that the power of prayer has healed up your family, your family that was afflicted with COVID, that it looked like it was going to be pretty bad. But had it not been for God and the power of prayer, Healing happened. That's testifying. See, you did that by God's grace. So I had that example. Now, 
often we fall into this aspect when we testify that we want to share. We want to thank each other for prayer. We want to make sure we transfer our minds into a different way of speaking and thinking. Because I'm thankful that you pray for me. But check this out. I thank God that you pray for me. Return all thanks where the power comes from. It doesn't come from me and it doesn't come from you. It doesn't come from any of you. The power, but the unity of God's people and the power of prayer invokes God to work down within all of our lives. See, we know that the power of God, we know the power of God and the power of the Holy Spirit working within the early church, working within their lives, they would offer witness and testify to the power of the Holy Spirit. In America, we've gotten away from this. I don't know why. We've gotten away from it maybe for fear of what, can I just say, maybe for fear of what somebody else will think. That's wrong. Because we're all about individualism anymore, right? In a postmodern society, we're all about me and what I want. Check it out. We got this thing called cancel culture, right? If I don't like it, well, I'll just, you know, get rid of it. I don't think that's right. But that's our movement in the last six months. It comes out of individualism. But there's no individualism in God's kingdom. It's about you, God, and what makes the cross? Neighbor as self. It's all connected. You're connected to God, so you're not an individual. Now you're God's child. You're adopted into his kingdom. And it's about loving neighbor. Oh, wait, neighbor. Even my neighbor. Even the neighbor that did wrong, even the neighbor that did right, loving neighbor as self. <clears throat> now, I'd love to tell you that the church, just as soon as you walk through the doors that were instantly transformed, and I'd love to say that the power of God transforms lives so that we um, are never uh, going to backslide what we used to do. We can backslide in a minute. And you don't have to be an alcoholic or a drug addict to have a bad backslide. You don't have to be a gambler to have a bad backslide. You can be a gossiper and have a bad backslide. Gossip is one of the hurtful things in the church. If we would come together and face-to-face -to -face talk, if you got a problem with your brother or sister, talk to them. If you got a problem with the preacher, come talk face-to-face. If you've got a concern, a desire, come talk face to face. I know it's COVID time. Talk six feet apart with a mask, mask to mask. Goodness, one day we're going to have a bonfire of masks at the church. <laughs> we'll bring them all and pile them up. Yeah, a little bit of her leftover firewood, some lighter fluid. Probably need a fire permit and a fire truck. We got some old masks laying around now. But not until it's time. So we recognize the need to come together for unity. I had one of you forward an email to me this week by accident by someone who had some pretty harsh words for me as a pastor in the last few months. And this person said, I'm sorry I sent it. My response, I want to share with you. I'm not going to share who it was or what it was. My response was, I have no problem with that person. I might have had a problem with a little bit of action they were doing, but I have no problem with them. I love them, and I pray that their heart can be transformed, and I pray that my heart can be transformed, and I pray for the minute when God allows us to sit face to face. I hope it's on this side of eternity. I hope there can be some opportunity for healing and unity. Will that mean that everybody comes running back and sets right where they were? Probably not. But it can be God's power for healing within the community. We know that when the church has healing, I'm going to go to another point now.
We know when the church has healing and the church has unity that our possessions we share. On last year, we did a social distance drive through. Help me, Nancy, if I get it wrong. Social distance drive through COVID friendly food drop. And at that time, the CDC said you had to put things outside for one minute to allow ultraviolet light to come down like, um, and kill the COVID. Sounds like something out of Marvel superhero book, doesn't it? And then, it's, then the food went from bad to clean uh, or Old Testament. But when we did that social distance food drop and had three tables and we were all like 20 feet apart, and everybody stayed away from each other and you did great. It was amazing to see what happened through the community because we worked together, but yet we weren't allowed to be around each other. So we made it work. And we took the food down to the Catholic food pantry and the Catholics that uh, were so excited in the mission team. And some of you were there and they said, I said, Pastor Tim, let, let me go get the priests so you all can pray together. How many of you went down there? Were you there? You were there, right. And, and, and at that point, Father Jim come down, if you remember, and he wanted to shake my hand and he held back and he wanted to smile, but he couldn't take his mask off. So we just stood away from each other and said, let's pray. And when does a Catholic priest and a Methodist pastor stand together in the basement of the Catholic church and pray and not have to be scripted and worked out? And pray in the name of Jesus. Pray in the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Thank God for what God is doing and take product that was not Methodist to start with. It was from God and give it to God's glory at the neighboring church. I don't know about you, but that was one of the highest moments I had in early May of a church community in mission was at this church. And then from there, we moved on and we fed the hungry at the Paris Foundation. And we made sure that God's people were, were, were taken care of here in the church. And we made sure that there was need that we shared it with one another through prayer. And we saw God doing healing. And we, we saw God moving in a way that Acts chapter 4 shows. When unity shows up by the people, God's healing happens. We know that as we saw this, that it's the power of God teaching and training us for the next thing to do, for the next step. I, I don't know about you, but I know some church people, they're good friends of mine. It's safer for them to go hang out at a bar on Saturday night than to come to church on Sunday morning. And they'll go into a bar and they'll talk to their friends and they don't even drink, most of them I know, but they know it's a place that they can talk about God that people will be open about their needs, their hurts. And they'll talk about the need for healing. They'll talk about how God has done something in their life. And that's why I'm here. In fact, there's two of them, but I know they do not drink a thing. If offered, it's a Coke or a Pepsi or a water or something. But this is their place that they used to have issues with. And God has done healing, so they go and they share the good news. And for some reason, they haven't quite felt welcome into the church. My, my, what we could do to change that. What we could do at a place like St. John's. I mentioned it a year ago, a Celebrate Recovery meeting would be awesome to have at the church. A um, meeting for those who are going through grief, grief share for recovery for those who've lost loved ones would be amazing. What would it look like now that we're coming into this time that the church has, in addition to the youth and the 4-H that meet here, an opportunity for community to come and be welcome and to be offered love and healing. See, when these things happen, we know that people become led and they become led to become part of the church community and the offering to God is amazing because they want to give back to God's glory because of so much that God has done for them. It's not about, oh, we got to keep the lights on the church. Oh, we have to keep the parking lot plowed. Oh, we have to, well, it's not rain, snow anymore. 
Oh, we have to mow the grass. Oh, we have to pay the insurance. Instead, it transitions into what would happen if the church was not there in the way it is now? There's no plans of this. Rumors started years ago that churches would disappear. Um, what would happen? I ask you to ask yourself this on the second Sunday of Easter. If St. John's didn't exist, would anybody notice? I'm glad you said yes, because I've been in churches where people couldn't even answer that because the church had been so unchurchlike for so long. In fact, I know churches that have closed and the community around have been excited because the church was finally gone. I'm glad we're at a church that we recognize that the church mission is that the lost can be found in Jesus Christ, that those who are found in Christ and even those who are seeking Christ are all welcome and invited into the church. I did tell you there's room to social distance. Look at that. We got enough room for 30 people on each side, eight feet apart. We know that the power of God at work within community is the power for healing. We know that God's healing and God's presence speaks to us, that it's so sweet. It's like the precious oil on the beard running down upon the beard, the beard of Aaron running all over the collar of his robe. It's like the dew of Hermon, which falls in a Mount of Zion. For there the Lord ordained his blessing, life forevermore. We know that in the scriptures, Jesus Christ came so that the doubts of Thomas would not be held against him. I don't know one believer that doesn't have a doubt at one point or another. In fact, I have a doubt every day of something. And when I ask God and confess my sin to God of my doubt, God is faithful and just, and he'll forgive us from there are things that are sin and wrong. And God will show you healing. I've seen God say, look, look at what I'm doing. I'm the Lord of the dance. I'm doing a new thing. I've even heard God say to me, would you like to be part of this? Tim, would you like to be part of the new thing I'm doing? I've been connected with some friends in Africa and in Africa through these connections, the church doesn't look like the church in America. Church service goes on for four hours. I had a talk with a friend in Liberia yesterday and told him I'll be coming in August for ministry for a week. I've got my second COVID shot. He laughed. He said, COVID has not been killing Africans the power of prayer. Hmm. Hmm. Just what we shared earlier. The reason he said this was, we've become so center focused on one issue in life in the last year as American Christians, that we have failed to see the need to reach and share Jesus with others. How many have passed away from just anything in the last year? And they've passed away, but they've passed away, and we haven't had a chance to share Jesus with them. In Africa, worship goes for four hours. In Africa, worship could be in a village in the center square, and it's distant outside. The church may not even have a roof yet because they're praying that God will provide. May not have a floor. It might be dirt. In Africa, not very many people are literate. So they don't have a bunch of Bibles, TV screens. They have one or two people can read. Did you know in Africa, they carry their Bibles with them everywhere, even the illiterate? Why, I asked. Because they're hoping they can come across someone that can read and they can open to John chapter three and say, can you tell me what these words are? And they memorize them. And when they memorize the words, they circle it. So when they go along the road to the next person that can't read, they bear witness and testify to what God has done by showing them the words so they can share the words with the next person. What would it look like in America? 
if we carried our Bibles with us, even if it was a little one in your pocket. I know we've got a cell phone. We've got the Bible everywhere right now. How can we bear witness for what God is doing in our lives? How can we bear witness about the power of the Holy Spirit? The way we testify about Jesus Christ and his love can transform someone's life and they can get right with God, not just have eternal life, but be changed right here, right now, right in front of us. I ask of you, if you've been saved, thanks be to God. If you've been saved and you know Jesus, you love Jesus, will you be willing to bear witness? Will you be willing to testify to God's goodness in your life? I'm so grateful that you did that earlier. It worked in good. <laughs> Has God been good to you? Here's the thing. So often, and I share about the COVID thing in Africa and here. It is killing people in Africa. But it's recognized that God's grace and God's power, eternal life is so real. When you live in a country where drinking water can kill you just every day, the need for salvation is greater. When you live in a country where your neighbors are radical Muslim and they'll come kill your Christian children to cause the church to diminish, the need to teach Jesus quickly for eternal life is great. Receiving Christ, we know then, can cause the little children to then be able to reach the other children that are not Christian also. The power of God works best, not through Zoom, not through Facebook Live, not even through uh, things that we would think. The power of God works best by one-on-one, -on -one, each of you being able to talk to someone. Sermon title next week might be called, Just Say Something. Because right now, God is telling me to say, amen. amen. And all the time, and all the time, God is good. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time as we worship here. And we ask, oh God, that you'd send your Holy Spirit down upon this place, down upon our hearts and our minds, God. And we ask that you'd send uh, a, a transforming spirit, a spirit of salvation and a spirit of transformation. In Jesus' name, amen.